right. Um, well, if you noticed, Brian is here. <laughs> so this is a little weird. Um, but as COVID is, seems to be striking everywhere, it's struck y'all's plans for this weekend, I, I understand. Um, and so uh, um, it just seems to be all over the place. Um, my daughter is in, uh, is in the Lodekai band, and uh, their football team is quarantined for two weeks now. So um, so goes the band halftime and all that. So, um, yeah, they've, apparently they played, my, my Lodekai football team played with um, their their freshman JV squad against um, an Amarillo High School on Friday and got demolished. Um, but it was because they were they were short. Bunch of their kids were, were quarantined. We don't know how many, but enough to cancel two two weekends of games. So uh, mm-hmm. here we go, right? <clears throat> um, but you know what? I get to teach, so that's a good. Thing. Um, um, I'm happy for that. I was telling um, I don't remember who I was telling over there that that I told Dewey that I that I wasn't going to commit to teaching full quarters for a while. But I'm happy to sell them, so I'm glad to be here again. I was here last week, and last week we talked about prayer. We're going to hit on that a little bit. Um, but this week we're going to talk about um, Paul's persevering boldness. So I want to start off by um, showing you a list, okay? This is a list of the top 10 fears in 2020, all right? So number 10 is the fear of holes, right? Okay. Number nine is the fear of flying. Number eight is the fear of germs. Number seven, the fear of small spaces. I can't believe the rate's not higher in 2020, right? Okay. Um, uh, number six is the fear of thunder and lightning. Number five is the fear of dogs. That's I, I have that one. Um, number four is the fear of open, crowded, open or crowded spaces, which I figured those would be two separate fears because they're two different things, but... Um, um, the fear of heights is number three, then the fear of snakes and the fear of spiders. So of those, um, of those 10, what are a, a couple that you agree with? Or maybe you have one that you want to add to that list. Fear of speaking. Fear of speaking. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's, that one's not on there, is it? Crowded spaces. I don't know. Crowded. Fear of the November election. <laughs> fear, of, fear of politics or fear of elections? Yeah, I I could see I could totally see that. Okay, or could that be fear of holes? Maybe could be. <laughs> Any others that stood out to you? I'm a little shocked that snakes is not number one. Mm-hmm. Right? I was I was surprised about spiders being number one. Like really? Like, just watch a spider yeah. like that, but a snake, um, yeah, that's true. And that mice are not on there. Oh, <laughs> right? Okay, mice. I, I put mice and germs together. Okay, like that's the thing with mice to me is I'm like, Ugh. You know, I forgot about one of mine is wasps. Okay, if y'all, so that's a bus driver for Roosevelt for a while, and you get a wasp on a bus. Oh. And you talk about having to like totally maintain your composure so you don't veer a bus off the road when there's a wasp like literally put in front of your face, right? Uh huh. Okay, I'm, I'm invoking fear right now, right? Yes. I walk my dog after dark, and um, I have a fear of dogs because there's you know stray dogs that come out of the alley, and I'll just be walking. I have headphones in, and all of a sudden, you know, and thankfully I haven't had any attack me, but I'll have some that come up and try to like lick me. <laughs> so I have a. The, the, the dog's one is, is a real one, too. So, um, did you add to your list the fear of stoning, the fear of shipwrecks, fear of jail? Keep that in mind. Okay? That's, where we're, that's where we're headed with this, okay? I just want you to, I just want you to know that. Um, what what uh, Sean likes to do, which I love, is he likes to take a look at, um, well, actually, let me, let me get back to, to where this fits in as well. Um, we all have fears in our life, but... Uh, we're called to follow Jesus, and sometimes the cost of following him is, him is high. He was stoning, jail, shipwreck, and stuff like that. Um, today, we're going to consider our fears of sharing our faith and why it is so important to push those fears. So, um, you said fear of speaking. Um, we add to that fear of speaking about our faith in Jesus, right? What What is that? You know, what about that fear? So, so be thinking along those lines um, as we go through today. Uh, Sean likes to look at um, Jesus' example first. 
Uh, so what we have here is a really neat example of kind of a dovetail from last week into this week, because what Jesus is doing here, I'm going to read this, um, this passage from Mark, and then we'll highlight what Jesus is up to. <clears throat> and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said, and everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next town, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went through Gal all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So the dovetail from last week is really one of the takeaways from last week was pray first, right? Prayer was the first thing that they did before they went out into the mission field, Paul, uh, Paul and his and his uh, uh, crew. So here we have an example of Jesus uh, starting his day that way. Okay, I picture Jesus kind of probably just needing some time and. Um, I'll bet he was interrupted before he was ready. Um, and so I don't know. Um, he doesn't act put off here. You can't really read that in the text very well. But um, what does he do? He says, all right, let's go because it's time to preach. So he, he talks about his desire to travel to the next town and to go preach the word and all that kind of thing. And we see Paul um, doing that very same thing. Okay. Uh, all right, so what we're going to notice here today, we're going to take kind of a, a flyover of Paul's first mission. So, so we're, like Jesus traveled to the next place, Paul traveled all over the place. And so I'm going to read kind of a synopsis of Paul's first mission, and it's going to be a flyover, but it's a, a lot of information which should indicate kind of the breadth of what Paul did here. So here's a, just a picture of kind of where it was. I don't know if you guys can see that very well or not, but, uh, but, but it's not super important that you see that. So... Paul's first missionary journey is found in Acts 13 and 14. Paul and Barnabas, set aside by the Holy Spirit, went out from Antioch, Syria, um, and John Mark was their helper. They sailed from Seleucia to Salamis and Pappas or, uh, on Cyrus. Paul blinds um, Elymas, who was speaking against the way. From, uh, from this point on, uh, the Bible uh, will refer to Saul only as Paul. John Mark deserts the group and returns to Jerusalem from Perga and Pamphylia. Paul uh, will preach his longest recorded uh, sermon in, in Antioch of Pisidia, uh, to which many Jews and Gentiles respond. From, Icon from Iconium, they are forced to flee because many plots against their life, uh, because of many plots against their life. In Lystra, Paul will heal a lame man. Um, the, the people will then call Paul and Barnabas Greek gods. Uh, many disciples are added to the church when Paul preaches in Derby. Paul and Barnabas will establish elders in Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, Pisidia, Pamphylia, and per, uh, Perga, Italia, um, as they return through. Uh, in Antioch, Syria, Paul would spend time writing his first epistle to the church in Galatia. Paul and Barnabas will end up in Jerusalem via Phoenicia and Samaria in 49 AD, reporting to the church leaders. This first journey had multiple stops with a distance over 1,400 miles in total. Okay, that was just his first mission. 1,400 miles. Um, there's a lot going on, and, and I, I, I purposely read that kind of quickly because I wanted to just indicate how much was going on. Um, but we're going to focus, our primary text here in just a second, we're going to focus on, on <clears throat> the boldness that, that Paul ex expresses um, here in just a second. But I want to give you guys some perspective first. Uh, this is the distance that he went, okay? Uh, this is 21 hours by car, averaging 65 miles an hour with no stops, okay? 21 hours. Now imagine walking that. There's this great movie, Forrest Gump, okay, where I, I don't know how long he walks, but I feel like it was something like that, or he runs or something, I don't remember what it is, but um, just imagine that journey. That gives you perspective as to what he did um, and, and where he went. So. Um, that is remarkable to me. I, I, I think it's a fault of mine being a lifelong Christian that you just read, so like you read any, any of Paul's letters, like the, the letter to Galatia that, that he just wrote during his first missionary journey. You read that, it's like, oh, that's great. You know, there's lots of good stuff in there, but you don't quite understand just what he's going through um, as he's doing that. So that's really, really remarkable. Okay, let's take a look at our primary text. We're going to read through this, and then we are going to um, kind of dissect it, okay, and see exactly when we talk about uh, Paul, uh, 
persevering um, and Paul's boldness, uh, we're going to dissect this passage and talk about how what that looks like. So <clears throat> the passage is Acts 14, 19 through 23, and it goes like this. Uh, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went out with Barnabas to Derby. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed him to the Lord in whom they had believed. Question. There's a general mentality that bad things only happen to bad people. What does this say about that? Is that, is that? is that true or not? Bad things only happen to bad people. Through many tribulations. Right. Tribulations. That's not fun. That's right. What they do to him right here at the at the beginning? Yeah, they stoned him, right? Okay, they stoned him and left him for dead. So um, I think a, it, it's it's a worldly mentality um, that uh, it, it's kind of a karma thing. Okay, it's like that's kind of a worldly mentality. But really, what this is teaching, what we're seeing here, is that that is not actually true. Um, we have that happening um, in the opposite, and we have, we see that with Paul. So let's let's um, kind of dissect this a little bit. So I want to uh, go back to verse 19, um, and it says that verse 19 was, uh, or it says that, but the Jews came from Antioch and, and Iconium, and having been persuaded, having persuaded the crowds, okay. Persuaded the crowd. What, did the, what were the Jews doing? They were saying, this guy is bad news, right? He is not He's not for us. They were trying to kind of get the crowd rallied behind them, right? Well, what did Saul do just you know, years before? That was straight out of Saul's playbook, wasn't it? He did the exact same thing. He rallied the crowds and, you know, he wasn't the one that threw the stones, but he certainly was the ones that were, were helping to make it easier, right, and, and cheering them along. So we have um, uh, a, a dark irony here that um, Luke um, uses kind of wording that's the same the same exact way that Paul did things. This was happening to Paul. So um, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting bit of irony there. So, and the very next thing they did uh, is after the Jews persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul. So when I thought of fears, none of us listed stoning, right? Um, what is the intent? Whenever a crowd looks to stone someone, what is their intent? They want them dead, okay? It's not just to annoy them a little bit or hurt them. They want to kill them. So imagine, put yourself in... Um, Paul's shoes for a second. You're standing there preaching the word and you see people start picking stones up. I can feel my own adrenaline just sort of, I don't know, I think I would have run or tried to. Um, I think maybe if I had run, maybe they would have just killed me right on the spot. Um, so, you talk about fear. I, I just don't know. I just know what that would have been like. Um, the next phrase, though, if that wasn't disturbing enough to put yourself in Paul's shoes as he's watching the stones be picked up and watching this, the, the, the rocks be hurled at him, uh, the next phrase is even more disturbing. And that was that they dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. So he was stoned to, to the brink basically, right? Um, uh, Luke is not clear about how long this event continued, but I would imagine that it wasn't a quick experience. I would imagine that it was, uh, well, no matter how fast it was, for Paul, it felt like an eternity, I would imagine, right? Uh, you know, um, <laughs> And the, the 
note here, actually, it's kind of what I was talking about, but um, as you look at your list of the top 10 things you're the most scared of, wasps and things, with, with stones to death or um, being stoned almost to the brink of death be on that list, no, it wouldn't, okay? That's one thing I'll tell you, uh, persecution is not really high on our list of, um, of uh, things we're afraid of. Now, I'm gonna ask another rhetorical question so if persecution is not on our list of things that we're afraid of, why are we so afraid to talk about it? And, I'm, and I'm, as I told y'all last week, I, I don't ever want y'all to think that I, because I'm up here teaching this, that I've got it figured out because I don't, okay? Um, what kind of, and I, and I think maybe there is a general fear of persecution, right? We don't want to, we, we don't want to be made fun of, or we don't want to be thought of as weird, or we don't want to be thought of as close-minded or rigid or you name the negative adjective that goes with um, that goes with sharing you know, sharing the gospel so um, before we uh, before we before I share the, the quote of the week any comments and by the way if you guys need to, want to comment as it goes through just let, just let me know any, any comments before we can keep moving I think it's our culture uh, I mean these two the vacuum man to come up to your front door and talk to you you know Right. Um, or the encyclopedia person, but if anybody approaches you, uh, you're going to have that standoffish. And then we have a development culture that's kind of a dichotomous thing. On one hand, it's, you know, just you do your thing and I'll do mine. Uh, but also, it's kind of the cancel culture that's forming now, too. So there's there's a lot of dynamics going on in that. Absolutely. I guess, and maybe a big overarching question for everybody is how do we get past that? Like, what, what do we do to get past um, the cultural stigmas that we are having to deal with? Um, and, and maybe my thoughts go to is it, is it possible to just kind of shirk that and say, I'm not going to worry about any of these cultural you know, dichotomies or stigmas or anything like that. I'm just going to just going to talk about it. Who cares what people think, right? Um, I think part of my head goes to um, what's the worst that can happen, right? If I share my faith with somebody, what's the worst that can happen? You know, lose a friendship, you know. But that's a bigger question if it comes down to your job and stuff like that, right? I mean, it's, it's just something to think about. One of the things is a natural skepticism in our culture as well. And so, right. uh, really it involves tilling the soil with people then at that point and then you're more able to enter into their world but that takes a lot of work just one person at a time it's true it's very true you have a funny story um that actually just came to my mind i was i was working a van festival yesterday and um, so i was working on parking lot where there was a whole bunch of buses um and uh, so I had this yellow vest on, right? So this or this orange vest. And so this orange vest made me made me important, right? I had no credentials. I had just learned how to do this job. I had this orange vest on. Well, the bus drivers, you know, I say, okay, I need you to park this here and then this here, and they're like, oh yeah, cool. So so they follow me, right? Well, then you get these parents coming in. Okay, pardon me if you have any parents. Parents, I know. <laughs> parents. I'm a parent of a high school kid. <laughs> So I get it, okay? So the parent, though, I'll walk up, I'll be in my car. I've got a golf cart, y'all. Yeah, that makes me even more. <laughs> so I got a golf cart and I got a yellow vest. I'll walk up to this parent who rolls up into the bus area. And I'm like, you've got to move your vehicle. We've got buses coming, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, like, who are you? Like, what authority do you have, right? So anyways, what makes me think about it, what you're you're talking about is this, this, um, this culture of skepticism, right? Like, who do... Who do you think you are to tell me about Jesus or to tell me about what I should or shouldn't be doing, right? You know, that orange vest doesn't mean jack, dude. Um, you know, your your faith, your Bible, whatever, doesn't mean anything. Um, and then, of course, we could dig into what the difference between the bus drivers and, uh, and the parents. Why do the bus drivers accept my authority where the parents don't, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but it really does... Um, I want everyone to ask yourself, who do we think we are in terms of sharing our faith? And so if we want to come across as someone who um, is genuine and whose words do matter, how do we do that? 
right? And but it's like you said, that's hard work, right? Because it's almost like you got to develop a relationship. You know, like I hop in the the, the seat next to the dude, and the parents will say, "Hey, dude, let me let me tell you something, man." So um, if you would park here, then every other parent thinks they're going to need to park here, and I'm just doing the job that I was told by somebody else. Can you give me can you give me some slack, you know? But you know what I mean? And I can have this like 15 minute conversation where I'm building rapport and connecting with this person. Then they might believe the orange vest a little bit better, right? But instead, I have to go in and like lay the hammer down. Doesn't land. Doesn't sit very well. So maybe there's some parallel there with how we share our faith. Um, if you haven't worked a fan festival parking lot, <laughs> you need to do that because it's going to help you share your faith better. Okay? <laughs> because you're going to want to. And then you got the dude that's you know got tattoos on his face and you are afraid that he's got a pistol, you know. <laughs> on his hip or something like that whenever you hop up to their car. You know, the, 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 it's, it's so dark, you can't see who's in there. Anyways, I digress. Um, <clears throat> that, I don't know, still not stoning to death, okay? Still not stoning to death, so we'll go there. Um, here's, okay, here's the quarter of the week. You know, uh, Sean again, he likes to do a quarter of the week, and I want to, uh, oops, that's not it. I missed, it. I missed the slide. Here it is, there's the slide. Um, uh, following Jesus always costs you something, okay? It just does, all right? That's the bottom line. And, and if we look at it, I, I really, uh, Brent, I really appreciate you talking about the, the uh, culture the culture we live in right now because if we are to truly show our faith, it's going to feel different than the culture. It's going to look different. It's going to cost us looking like the rest of the crowd, right? I mean, and there's a lot of things that could cost us. What are some other things, like in this day and time, in 2020 America, that could cost us for following Jesus? So if you read the news, there's persecution going on everywhere. With regards, especially in academics, True. Uh, college level, um, the people who express their faith, you're living in uh, some of these corporate uh, big corporations where you speak certain things or hold a certain standards, you you will be profiled and could lose your job. Yep, that's right. Uh, and then, and then, you know, there's some obvious examples of going overseas and things like that, that, um, that matter as well. So, <clears throat> all right, so we have a, an example of boldness here. He is fearless, right, that he's willing to do what he's doing um, uh, at, to, to the point of death, okay? Um, but if that is, as if that is not enough, uh, what does Paul do next? Um, and I'm going to go back, let's see, uh, back here. Um Paul was dragged to the out of the Paul, they stoned and Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, uh, he rose up and entered the city. Um, all right, stop right there. Uh, if that's not crazy enough, Paul went back in. Like what? So they drag him out, like and probably I don't know, dump him in the forest, some, something, because they think he's dead. <clears throat> uh, um, and so what happens, and this is this is incredible. So verse 20 says that the disciples gathered around him. Okay, so imagine, imagine that he's out there dead, and I don't know if the disciples followed immediately, or maybe they kind of scattered a little bit and came out just a little bit later. But um, the phrase in here uh, is that they literally formed a circle around uh, around him. They, and it's not clear whether it's his traveling party or if it's his, if his disciples from, uh, from Lystra. Um, but either way, those that once feared Paul and the ones he stood against were brought together through Christ around him. So what an incredible picture. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, they, uh, they, they returned. This is crazy. So Paul was able to preach and make many disciples. Um, sometimes it takes getting back up after defeat for great things to happen. In this case, many souls were saved because of Paul's determination. Uh, we need to not be so quick to throw in the towel. Um, the, the importance of this is that Paul was so passionate about, matured, um, about maturing disciples 
um, imparting spiritual gifts, strengthening and encouraging you disciples that he was willing to return to the city that mistreated him and rang him out. Uh, he returned to the very city that stoned him. And so I think that as we encounter things that make us, part of the reason fear exists is because something happened bad in response to that. Like I got stung by a wasp and so now I hate wasps. Okay, well, does that mean that wasps are evil and I should never be around them? Well, no, it just means that it hurt one time. And so now I have this irrational fear. Right? <clears throat> um, same thing goes with this. If you had tried to share your faith before and it fell flat, if you tried to share your faith and um, something happened that made it awkward or that, that you lost a friend or who knows what happened, um, the, the, the idea here is that we don't give up. Just because it was hard the first time um, doesn't mean that we need to not keep trying. Okay, So that's kind of where... Um, where we're going with that. So um, I think it's interesting that, hold on a second, let me go back. Okay. Um, it's interesting, I'm just gonna read this. It says, Paul's, Paul's returning also reminds us that baptizing someone is just the beginning. Okay, Jesus thought that we make disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them to obey. So. Uh, Matthew, uh, let's see, this is in here. Yeah, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So baptism is just the beginning, right? So in terms of the mission field, that is like the starting point. I always believe that, um, that, that, and I'm really, I'm actually trying to teach this to my daughter. My daughter is like, she's like, I'm not ready to be baptized yet. I'm like, okay, wait. You're never going to be good enough for that. Okay, it's like you gotta. Baptism is the starting point, not the ending point. Does that make sense? Of course, and you know, that's what that's what Jesus preaches, and that's what I'm trying to, to get across to her. Um, so even after baptism, though, we are still making disciples. We are still um, working to further the kingdom, even after we have um, baptized somebody. Uh, Jerry uh, Tallman has a phrase or. I don't, this isn't really a quote, it's just something to, to think about in terms of discipleship. And the way he puts it is uh, that he used to say every disciple should be a part of one of three groups, uh, meet, win, or keep. Okay, so disciples that are, um, that you, you can either be a disciple that's out meeting the lost and introducing them to Jesus. You can be a disciple who is studying the Bible uh, with the lost and winning them for Jesus. Or you can be a disciple that's helping keep the saved within Jesus. So no matter where you are on this spectrum, uh, we all have something to be doing as disciples. And, and y'all, this could be a spiritual gifts conversation as well that we haven't even talked about. Well, what if you're the one that just brings them in the door, right? You're the meter. And I'll say, I'm going to introduce you to Daryl Price. <laughs> That's the guy that comes to my mind when I think about, about winning somebody, okay? That kind of thing. You, you know who, who your go-to people are, right? Or... You're the kind of person that strengthens a Christian's faith by keeping them in the word. Whenever you, that would be, I, I would consider myself in that category. When I meet guys, um, I work with the sex addiction support group. And so when I meet guys that are at rock bottom, um, uh, I want to keep them in the faith and keep them and strengthen them and encourage them. So, so you, and no matter where you're at, you're part of the disciple conversation. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so think along those lines. All right, let's take a look at verse 22. I'm going to go back to verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and, stay, and saying that through many tribulations uh, we must enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> New disciples need other disciples to pour into them. They need strengthening, encouragement. They need somebody to walk with them through difficult times. This is kind of a reinforcement of the, of the meet and keep uh, concept. Um, continue in the faith. Uh, the language seems to indicate that Paul's efforts were desperately needed. As Luke has already pointed out in Acts 1, persecution of the way was a growing movement along, alongside the growth of the way, uh, alongside the growth of the way. So new disciples needed to be spurred on, especially in the light of tribulations that were to come. I could imagine, y'all, I mean, I mean, imagine what Paul's having to go through here whenever his disciples see him get nearly killed, nearly stoned to death, okay? I mean... You know, shooting between the eyes, but don't stone me because my goodness, could you? I mean, it just is an awful experience. So you got disciples that are um, that are saying, "I'm out." Like I, there's no way that I'm going to keep enduring this. And so this this verse, uh, this section is talking about 
um, encouraging them to continue in the faith uh, because there will be um, tribulations. There will be many tribulations. There's a self-reflection here that, that asks, um, if I knew that I had to go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God, would I still be willing You don't necessarily have to answer that question because, you know, what is tribulation to us? Okay, what does that mean? If it meant that you lost your job, if it meant that you had to disown your family, what tribul what's too much for you? That would be a that would that, I think that's a bigger question. What's too much? What's the thing? You, you all have that that thing that you're like, okay, I can't I can't do this anymore. I know I've got a good friend of mine who is scared to pray, pray for patience and pray for God to, to increase his faith because he's afraid that God is going to put him through something. Um, so this is what Paul's dealing with is, as they see, you know, as they see friends, of, uh, as they see him be nearly killed. And I'm sure they saw, you know, they saw Stephen uh, was killed and, and, uh, I know that they have close friends and family that are being persecuted, and yet Paul is encouraging them to keep going. So that's the question for y'all is, um, uh, where's your breaking point and what are you going to go through? Um, and yet we, in this very classroom, in this church, we have people that are going through hard times, right? And, and What's it doing to you? What's it doing to their faith and your faith? Verse 23 talks about um, appointing elders, which uh, we're going, Paul talks more about in Timothy and Titus, about those the qual qualifications for that. Um, I love the fact that, that amidst, um, amongst all of this, he is wanting to plant leaders in these churches uh, to keep them going. <clears throat> and then uh, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord and He made it believe. Uh, this is uh, the echoing of the beginning, where he starts with prayer and he and he ends with prayer, um, which I absolutely love, and uh, and it is clear that it's a vital part of their um, part of their mission effort. Um, and uh, the last the last point in verse 23 is that, that they committed themselves to the Lord. Um, so they are, these elders are being entrusted uh, to the one who they placed their trust. Oh, well, this was a little heavy, um, heavier than last week, but, uh, but I want you guys to really come away with um, Paul's uh, very blatant and overt Boldness and perseverance. Okay, he did not back down. He did not quit. He was. Um, I, I even imagine you see his his missionary journeys. You know, I would imagine he had a hard time leading places, right? But you see in the very end of this passage that you know he uh, committed them to the Lord, and he they prayed over them and fasted over them, and so he. he I think that there was a, a statement of faith there as, as he left. So here's some. Um, some prayer ideas um, for us this week. And the first one is, that, God, please give me your boldness to share my faith. Uh, give me your boldness to share my faith. And, and I want to add to that, um, that, that God, help us to see past our fear, whatever the fear happens to be. Help us to look on the other side of that and ask, just ask yourself, um, what's the worst that could happen? What's the best that could happen? Okay. What is there to lose? What is there to gain? And you're looking at somebody who you know is not saved. Do you want to see them in heaven next time? You know, that's 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 the question. And what's it? What are you going to pay for that? What's the cost for that? Okay. So there's a prayer idea for us. Um, and then I think we've already sort of meditated on this a little bit, but I want to, um, but I want to ask this question: What is your greatest fear? Really and truly, what's your greatest fear? I imagine it's bigger than spiders, probably bigger than mice and snakes, um, but there's something bigger. Um, and, and then the follow-up question that, that, uh, that Sean lists here is, um, uh, 
what is more scary to me than losing my relationship with Jesus? All right. Challenge for the week. Who are the disciples that I am strengthening and encouraging in the faith? Who you know that you want to encourage, lift up, strengthen? One of the neatest things about this church is that this church is an encouraging church. We uh, encourage people all the time. And so I am confident that um, if you don't write it out, if you guys are writers, that, that's wonderful. But you're going up to folks and you're um, encouraging them and, and, um, and lifting them up. That's the kind of church that we are a part of here. So um, thank you for this morning, uh, everybody. Let me say a prayer um, before we before we wrap it up. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for this morning. Um, God, I want to simply ask two things. First, have mercy on us because we are sinners. Father, we, we do not get it right. Um, as hard as we study and as much as we grow, Father, we're still, we still fall short. So have mercy on us, Father. Um, and secondly, God, give us the boldness to share our faith. Whatever's holding us back, Father, convict us. Um, break our hearts, Father, that we may be bold to share your faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.